So good morning, good morning. It's a, <clears throat> it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with Father Voyle, who is, uh, who is a hero. And uh, I'm very thrilled to be able to ask him some questions that have troubled me. You know, he is a priest, so one can confess. I'm going to start with a very simple one. Explain what a homeboy is. Uh, well, a homeboy is a gang member, I guess, but it's also, uh, more broadly speaking, it's somebody with whom you have a connection. So um, we call our organization Homeboy Industries, so it's the largest gang uh, reentry rehabilitation program on the planet. And so 10,000 uh, gang members walk through our doors every year trying to reimagine their lives. But but a homeboy can also mean, kind of generally speaking, uh, you know, that's a person with whom I connect. So it's not just a, a member of my gang. So they connect with you. They call Father, they call him Father G, or just G, because it's all part of this wonderful, encompassing life that he sets up at Homeboy Industries. I want to also begin to make sure we're all on the same page. Would you talk about tattoos for a minute? The this book? Is, the book no, the actual, the actual tattoo book available in the bookstore. You could get them today. Okay. What about gang, gang tattoos? Oh, well, Have you ever seen gang tattoos? Yeah, so, so they're a kind of markings that uh, you know, declare some allegiance to a particular gang, I guess. Um, and we have free tattoo removal, so we have a clinic in our headquarters, three laser machines and one paid physician assistant and like 46 volunteer doctors, so we remove tattoos um, Monday through Friday, nine to five. So if anybody's regretting their <laughs> tattoo, come see me afterwards. And so, yeah, so we don't force anybody to get them removed, but we do uh, always offer that. Yeah. And what are the tattoos like? Where are they and how big are they? Oh, well, it, it, there was a homie. Is that better? It, there's a homie who Thank works you. there named Mario, who was the most tattooed individual who's ever worked there. And he's all sleeved out all the way down to his fingertips. His neck is blackened with the name of his gang. Head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin. Eyelids that say the end so that apparently when he's lying in his coffin, there won't be any doubt for anybody, I guess. And, and so he's an exceedingly tattooed person. I love this book. This is Father Boyle's new book, and it's a selection of writings from other books that he's done. I know that you say you're tired of people saying, what are your successes? They want to know success stories. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I, I agree with Mother Teresa who, who says that we're not called to be successful, we're called to be faithful. So uh, part of the problem, of course, is if, you know, uh, funders, of course, want evidence-based outcomes and success stories. And, and if success is your engine, then you're likely to only work with the most likely to succeed. And so... That's kind of, we're allergic to that at, at Homeboys. So we're, we're kind of reverse cherry pickers. We want to work with folks who are difficult, you know, because in, an, in a sense, you want to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And so you don't, uh, you really want to work with people who nobody else uh, wants to work with and so that that becomes kind of a hallmark of what we do at, at homeboy and now women home girls right yeah though you know women represent like three to five percent of the 120,000 gang members uh, in Los Angeles County so it's still principally a guy thing but if so every male who works at homeboy uh, has to be a gang member, but every female uh, has to be at least a felon. So, because if we said you have to be a gang member, we wouldn't have any women there. 
So we, we had to change who we were a little bit in order to accommodate women, and now we have 40% women, uh, women who are felons. That's kind of an amazing thing. Uh, when someone arrives at the homeboy, first time, walks in, tattoos, who greets them? How does that all work? Well, our headquarters in Chinatown in downtown Los Angeles is this huge place. And it has a bakery and a restaurant and a merchandise store and, and lots of An space. An excellent guacamole. Yeah. Excellent guacamole. Yeah. You can get it at your Kroger's. It's good. It's good, yeah. So, so they, they come in, and our place doesn't exist for those who need help. It's only for those who want it. So you have to walk in the door. But once you do, it's kind of red carpet and ticker tape parade and... And you're welcomed. You know, the Buddhists say, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. So, so you want to create a safe place where people can remember who they really are, where they can be seen and cherished. And uh, at the homies, because they've been locked up for a lot of years, will say, we're used to being watched, but we're not used to being seen. And so that's a very healing prospect for uh, someone to be seen and so they walk in and they're greeted by other gang members and uh, and they begin if, if they want to get into the 18 month program it begins with drug testing and then an orientation and then an interview or they can just come in for anger management classes or tattoo removal or therapy or a whole slew of services but the services are secondary to the culture that cherishes them So I'm going to read a couple sentences and then I'm going to ask Father World to talk about the various people in this book. Is that okay with you? you do, I'm putty in your hands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hear that, my husband? I want you to hear that. <laughs> so you quote Isaiah, do not fear for I am with you. Now, I want to say something. This is a reflective and meditative book. You don't have to be Catholic, you don't have to be Protestant, you don't have to be Jewish, you don't have to be Muslim. I think it's a gift for anyone to take some time and read these various, I guess, pieces of essays, right? Yeah. That'd be all right, pieces of essays. And so the first thing is, we protect each other. What does that mean? Uh, I, I don't really know what the... Uh this yeah, I, I don't know. So, so, so I should say something about this book. This is, it's a compilation of stories from all my other books. And for my money, I wanted it just to be a showcase for the artwork. In it's fabulous. There. And there's a homie who uh, runs our homeboy art academy, Fabian Devora. And uh, so it's all his artwork. So I kind of, it was a, a ploy to get his <laughs> artwork out there. So, but uh, what was the thing? Pro we protect... Well, the line is, I'll, I'll read you a little more. During the early months of the pandemic, before we settled into whatever needed settling, oh, yeah, so we all right. kept choosing to be each other's PPE. Yeah, so it, that was just a reflection on, uh, from some part of a book, uh, probably from the whole language. Uh, you know where people really choose to cherish each other. Okay, so if the principle is a traumatized person is more likely to cause trauma and damage, then it has to be true that a cherished person will be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and others. And so you create this environment. I think it's the secret sauce of Homeboy. You know, lots of people in cities offer services. We offer the same services. But the difference is, what heals really is, is the relationship found in a community of beloved belonging, where people feel they belong. And so that's kind of an essential piece. Otherwise, you become the DMV, you know, you're delivering services. And, uh, and, and that's good, we do all that. That's secondary uh, to how people feel. You know, we're 35 years old as an organization, and so we were, um, probably the first 15 years, we were job-centric, and now we're healing-centered. 
And the idea is that uh, an employed gang member may or may not go back to prison, or even an educated one may or may not, but, but it is our guarantee that a healed gang member will not reoffend. period, the end, ever. And so, so that became our goal. And uh, so that's when we started this 18-month program that after we had chosen 18 months, we thought two years is too long, one year is too short. But 18 months is the time it takes for an infant to attach to the caregiver. So we looked back at that and we said, yeah, it really is about attachment repair, you know, because gang members come in with a disorganized attachment, as psychologists would say. Uh, mom was either frightened or frightening and you can't calm yourself if you've never been soothed so they come through the door really barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace and the only thing that can scale that wall is tenderness so it's a place where folks are held and protected and uh, cherished I like, I like the cherished it's a good one, isn't it? It's a good word. <laughs> it's a good we, verb. Yeah, we all, we all yearn for that. Um, here, there's another. I wish, I wish I had a screen to put these. But when you buy your own copy, you can have these. <laughs> Show it to me. What's it say? This one is Rejoice. Oh, aha. Uh-huh. And, and uh, this is from a psalm. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment his favor is for a lifetime. Talk about anger with the guys coming in. A lot of anger? Yeah, I, I suppose there is, you know. Uh, but everything is about something else. Gang violence is about a lethal absence of hope. So if you think, well, we're going to roll up our sleeves and address gang violence, and, and which is what we did in the 80s and the 90s. It was get tough and wipe them out and operation uh, whatever. You know, it's, uh, but it was about something else. So if you can infuse hope to kids for whom hope is foreign, well, now we're talking. Now we're doing something about, uh, you know, gang violence. But anger is the same thing. It points beyond itself, you know, to the thorn. The homies always talk about find the thorn underneath, which I think is quite wise. And so that's why we're not really tripped up by behavior. The goal is not to become, you know, a behaving community, but a community of beloved belonging. And so behavior is just a signal. It's an indicator. Something's going on. Let's address what's going on. But as a society, we want to address the symptom rather than what's underneath it. And uh, so I... I think it's important to, uh, to, you know, what does this mean? What is it telling you? What is this violence? What language is it speaking? So you want the anger is but a language, and you need to, you know, get it translated. You know, so I should say that I, I think they picked out little scripture passages to show them into my my reflections, <laughs> so that I could highlight. The artwork so that's kind of I was a sucker for the whole thing <laughs> well it's good I'm glad it, it's I it, this, I'm is glad great. It. this is great because it's kind of a devotional if you will you know it where is. you just read one a day and you go oh, okay and then you go about your day so as I read tattoos I was reminded of a, of a Catholic priest who taught me at divinity school Henry Nowen. Oh, I knew Henry Nowen. I did too. I and did he taught too. me and, and at he, Harvard. Is that right? Yeah. And his whole theory was that hospitality was ministry. Yeah. I cooked him a lot of meals. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't such a good cook then. He enjoyed it. Oh, he was a giant. A giant, a giant. And I think that in some ways this is very reflective because you offer a home to the homies. Yeah, yeah. And it's I, more home than home, they'll say, you know, which is... Is that what they say? Yeah, because they, they've had such a kind of often a bad experience of home. You know, it, um, Henry Nowen taught a course, uh, he and Parker Palmer, a team taught at Harvard, 
divinity, and it was a, a course on ministry. And I remember somebody asked him, what is ministry? And, and I remember he was, fr- he was not going through a good period, and you know, he ended up, that's when he left Harvard and w- found the Larsh communities yes. where he finally died. But, but she said, what is ministry? And, she, and he was frustrated with her. He said, can you receive people? Which I, I'll never forget that. And that was many years ago. And, and it reminded me of uh, a homie. I was in Houston. I gave a talk, and he was covered in tattoos, and he was working with gang members in Houston. And he came up to me, and he pleaded with me, and he said, uh, how do you reach them, meaning gang members? And I found myself saying, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Which reminded me of what Henry Nouwen had said, that can you receive people? Can you be reached by them? Can you allow your heart to be altered? And that ties into the earlier thing about success, because if it's about fixing, saving, and rescuing, then it's about you. So you don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. And then it becomes about us which is a whole different way, but it connects to his notion of hospitality, but receiving people. So I'm gonna continue down this path. Don't stop. Well, I don't, I don't. I'm very committed. Oh, I wish I could show you. I love this line. God can get tiny if we're not careful. Want to talk about that? Yeah, you know, so I think there's nothing more consequential than our notion of God, because if it's puny, then you have no choice except to be puny. But if God is spacious and expansive, then that's how you're going to be in the world, compassionate and loving and kind. And Meister Eckhart, a uh, uh, mystic and a theologian who died in, I don't remember, 1320 or something, but he... He used to say, which sounds so modern, it is a lie, any talk of God that doesn't comfort you. Well, that's a spacious God as opposed to a finger-wagging one. And that's a warm sun as opposed to a cold, bitter wind. And so so you don't want the notion to be... uh, Sometimes our notions are young, you know, they're like baby teeth. You know, I don't have anything against baby teeth, but you know you're going to move beyond them to something more formidable and stronger, and and that's as it should be. That's what maturation, you know, should look like. And so. Is, Is there formal religious stuff that happens within the homeboy institution? No, because, you know, homies are, uh, you know, they're agnostics, they're atheists, they're, you know, uh, Christian, not Catholic, or they're Catholic, or they're Buddhists, or they're Muslim, you know, so, uh, so there isn't any kind of, though we have a morning meeting where somebody gives a thought for the day and we announce things and, and somebody always leads a prayer to end it, but it's, it's as spacious as our God would hope we'd be. I love that. So, here's a psalm. For your steadfast love is greater than the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Now, we know you're faithful. What, what, what percentage, this is a bad question, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> what, what percentage of the homeboys I don't want to say succeed. What should I say? Win. I mean, what, what percentage you know, of them? You know, part of the, the, the language we would use would be transformation. Not that I transform somebody, for example. But that transformation happens there. And, and transformation is coming to know the truth of who you are. That you're exactly what God had in mind when God made you. Transformation is finding your true self and loving, being able to let love live through you. Uh, So, you know, sometimes funders will say, yeah, you know, we like what you're doing, but we wanna wanna fund, you know, programs that help kids, children. I go, well, 
all of the homies are parents. And, and they become sturdy and resilient at Homeboy. And after 18 months, they leave us. And, and the place has become a sanctuary. And then they become the sanctuary that they sought. And then they go home and they provide that sanctuary to their kids and suddenly you've broken a cycle. So hard to know what success is except that that's transformative. Where um, I heard a homie say the other day, he goes, my kids will never join a gang. And, and he says that with some certainty. But he's right. He can be certain of that only because he has effectively broken a cycle. And that's what you hope for. The problem with success is, in the old days, you know, somebody would leave, get arrested again, or relapse or something. And we used to fret about it. We used to say, oh my gosh, you know, maybe they'll be back. And nobody says that now. We all say, he'll be back. And there's a kind of a confidence in that, a certainty that's well-founded, you know, they all come back. So then you start to re- believe in the dosage, that somebody's getting a dose of something, and, and that that's powerful, and they'll never forget that dose, which is why they come back, because once you've had that experience of uh, inhabiting the truth of who you are, and... You know, we're allergic to the idea of holding the bar up and asking folks to measure up, mainly because the God we actually have doesn't do that. So you hold the mirror up and you give people back. It's exquisitely mutual. You stand looking at each other, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And then together you're inhabiting your own dignity and your own nobility. And that is transformational for everybody involved. So it's not like I will impart this to you. It's let's do this together and I will do it by way of receiving you and and allowing you to reach me and allowing you to alter my heart. And I think it's a good way to be in the world. I want to sidetrack for a minute. Why uh, are gangs so prevalent in, in East Los Angeles? And among, uh, I don't know, is it still Mexican Americans? Is it also Guatemalan Americans? Is it Honduran Americans? Uh, among Latin Americans, why is that? Well, it's, it's um, because it's about a lethal absence of hope. Go to the places in LA County where that exists. And it's going to be where people carry more than any other place. Part of the goal of Homeboy is to is to invite people to stand in awe at what folks have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. And, and you want people to, in the, in the course of that, to welcome their own wound because if we don't welcome our own wound, we will be tempted to despise the wounded, which is a thing that happens in our country. And, and so the movement towards compassion is, is an understanding of the thorn underneath. What are people carrying? I grew up in L.A., the gang capital of the world, went to Loyola High School. I, you know, f- uh, two wonderful parents, five sisters, two brothers. And there was no chance that I would join a gang, none. And that's not because of some, you know, moral sense That's just because I won all the lotteries, you know, parents and zip code and Jesuit education or whatever it is you want to list, the list is long, you know. But, uh, you know, morality has never kept us moral. It's only kept us from each other. So it's not a very helpful construct, actually, because it keeps us from seeing that, in fact, some people have to carry more than others. So that should lead us to a sense of of deep compassion and tenderness. Now now that we have so many people in Los Angeles County living on the streets, the last count was 64,000. And of those 64,000, 15,000 were women. 
when I was at the LA Times in the 80s and I first wrote about the downtown women's center which had opened on Skid Row, we had 400 women living on the streets in Los Angeles County. Now it's up to 15,000. And these are not women who, are, who have anywhere to go at night. They are on the streets. And there's lots of programs that we're trying to make work. And, and there's a lot of good people trying to do it. But I've always been shocked at how much people really find the poor distasteful. That, I mean, I'm not talking about people living under the, the overpasses. I'm talking about just generally. I mean, poor people, and I'll ask you to comment on this, are not attractive. They just aren't. They don't have a, a good haircut. I'm only going to talk about women. They don't have a good haircut. They don't have the right clothes. They're not clean. Uh, they're talking to God through their toaster ovens. I mean, they're really quite a mess. And so there's some unpleasant but seemingly natural reaction that we want to distance ourselves from the poor or we want to make them into an objectified presence. And, and now, you've just turned that all around where you are. It's amazing. That's a compliment. It's really amazing. So, you know, I think part, what would we have to embrace in order to make progress in everything? You know, a, a, a woman who works with homeless folks says, you know, people don't become homeless because they run out of money. They become homeless because they run out of relationships, which uh, resonates also with gang members. And that, what would we have to embrace to actually make progress on the front of the unhoused and violence and police brutality and uh, you name it. What would we have to embrace? I think we'd have to embrace two things, two notions and beliefs. One, that every human being is unshakably good. Gang members have taught me that. And number two, Mother Teresa used to say, that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So every human being is unshakably good and we belong to each other. If we embrace those things, it would only change everything. And that's a tough one. Now, I, I just a parenthesis, you know, in the wake of uh, Tyree Nichols and his death, um, you know, they disbanded that special police task force called SCORPION. And, and the RP in the word SCORPION in the acronym stands for Restoring Peace. Now you say, well, you know, if you asked any police officer anywhere, what does restore peace mean? To de-escalate violence? No, they, no, and this is not anti-police to say this, I don't think, except it's anti-us. <laughs> In, in as much as it, we're all complicit in this notion. If you, say, if you ask any police officer on that task force or otherwise, what is your, what's your goal? What, are, what, what do you do? What's your task? And I think they would answer it as I've heard police officers answer it many, many times. They would say, our task is a simple one. Get the bad guy. Now we're complicit because we think there is such a thing as a bad guy. And if there is a bad guy, then all bets are off. You can do anything. I just heard the other day, I think it was in LA, a double amputee, homeless, in a wheelchair, shot to death by the police. Why? Because he had a knife and he was brandishing it. They didn't shoot him because he was a threat. I mean, gosh. They shot him because he had presented himself, indicated that in fact he was a bad guy. How did he do that? He had a knife, he was brandishing it. <sighs> we will make progress if we embrace those two notions. Everybody's unshakably good. And we belong to each other. And people will say to me, I mean, I know countless people murdered. But I've never met a bad person. And that doesn't make me Father Flanagan. 
that just goes, I've met despondent people, I've met mentally ill people, I've met traumatized people, I've met damaged people, I've never met a bad person. But once you can see that everybody's essential truth is that they're unshakably good, and there are things that prevent this person from knowing that goodness. A homie the other day in my office, we were finishing a conversation, and he says, you know what I think the whole point of life is? I said, what? He said, to remove the blindfold. And I said, that's pretty good. And I said, and once you remove that blindfold, what do you see? And he put his hand on his heart and he said, goodness. And that's exactly right. Is it despair? Is it trauma? Is it damage? Is it mental illness? Remove the blindfold. Once the blindfold falls, what do you see? You see unshakable goodness. And it's okay for you, us, to see it before the person sees it. So it's frustrating because it, we don't make progress. We kind of spin our wheels and it's because we cling to notions that are uh, the opposite of how God sees, if I may dare to say that. <laughs> I think he can say it, doesn't he? Figure, I'm, I'm for that, I'm for that. So uh, I spend a lot of my life involved with the Downtown Women's Center, where we have an extraordinary new chairperson, Elizabeth Rowe, and we're moving along to sustainable housing, opening buildings all over the city. And it's so interesting to me because the two original buildings, which are downtown, were built years ago. And the women have aged in those apartments. And when you go into those apartments, they're perfect. I mean, you cannot believe. I mean, I often think maybe they're on their hands and knees scrubbing the floor at night. I mean, they're perfect. The dishes are perfect. The bed is made. It's like a military operation. And it's so amazing to me that if you give people a chance, which is what you've talked about all through this conversation, that they really do many times rise up to the occasion. They really do want to be a better person. And I don't mean to make that simplistically, but I think it's factual that then people say, I can do that, I can, we all have friends who are mired in, in depression, and then maybe they take a pill, maybe they take a therapist, and suddenly they come out the other side if we're lucky, and, and we're astounded by how well they're doing because they suddenly have an exit from their problem. Uh, and you provide exits. I'm going back to the book. I got a few more things to ask you. Okay. This is, in the correspondence with a priest in Ireland, Jackie Kennedy wrote that she felt bitter towards God after the assassination of her husband. How could God let this happen, she asked, but God wasn't in the Texas School Book Depository aiding and abetting, God was and is in the heartbreak and in the insight board of sadness and in the arms that we wrap around our grief. I have felt this every time a kid is gunned down. Yeah, it's, so uh, today's Wednesday. Tomorrow I have a funeral of a 13-year-old boy who was um, stabbed to death in a Chick-fil-A in downtown LA, it was on the news. Well, his father, a kid named Marco, who worked for us and had moved on from Homeboy and um, doing really well in the construction trade. And uh, obviously this is his oldest son and he's just uh, beside himself with grief. But he was, I hope, no longer, uh, he was utterly convinced that this happened because uh, this was sort of God's way of paying him back for all the horrible things he had been engaged in as a kid and as an active gang member. And, you know, the church has done a lot of damage in terms of this notion, you know, kind of. Uh, and I, I, it's so regrettable and heartbreaking because, you know, obviously God's heart is broken by the very thing that breaks the heart of this kid. And, uh, and God didn't have anything to do with it. And, and, and the, the ones who surrounded this kid and fought him and then ultimately stabbed him 
to death. You know, who are, are kids who are carrying stuff that, that we all need to help in the healing. So, you know, even as we talk about hate these days, dismantling hate, and I go, I don't know. I've never, I'm 68 years old, but I've never met a healthy person who hated, period, ever. Nobody well, nobody whole, nobody healthy has ever hated. So is it about hate or is it about health? And, and how do we walk each other home to health? How, you know, it, at, at the moment, you know, mass incarceration is about choosing to punish wound rather than heal wound. By the same token, you know, how do you address hate? Hate is an indicator. It's pointing beyond itself to, to people not being well. I, I recently, I was in the Chicago Midway uh, airport and it was the tale of two t-shirts. There was a woman had a t-shirt that said, love, not hate. I remember looking at it and I'm going, oh, that's why we don't make progress. Because it's me against you, I love, you hate, uh, I stand against you, it's about me. <laughs> and it's not very sophisticated. In the same airport, I, I saw a woman wearing a, a t-shirt, huge capital letters, it said, unwell. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I remember thinking, oh, wow, finally, progress, you know. <laughs> and, and I think that has everything to do with everything. First of all, it can't be about me. If I denounce something, it's really about me. I don't know how else to say that. And how do, you, how do you help people? How do you love them into wholeness? How do you, as Ram Das used to say, walk people home? And... And I think that's what we're called to do. And it's why we don't make progress. <laughs> because it's still us against them. I love and you hate and I'm against you. And, but, but it's really about something else. And the trick in life is always to find the something else. So nobody healthy in the history of the world has ever shot up an elementary school or a dance hall or invaded Ukraine or slapped uh, Chris Rock at the Oscars. I mean, the list is long. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's not about violence, it's not about hate, it's about we, none of us are well until all of us are well. And if we believe that we're unshakably good and we belong to each other, then we're gonna roll up our sleeves. And, and how am I gonna help, how will we help each other get to the place of wholeness? And, and it's not a once and for all thing. We're all on a continuum of, of, of unhealth, you know, or health, you know. So I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a necessary step in order to make progress. I, we would do well to ask ourselves, why don't we make progress? We're, still, we're always spinning our wheels when it comes to these Hugely vexing, complex social dilemma. Sounds to me like you've made a lot of progress, Father, a lot of <laughs> progress. So I'm going to ask you, I think we're coming to an end. Exactly, 5.30. I'm going to ask the, uh, oh my God, it does say 527. Okay. <laughs> Counting down, I never even noticed it. I never even noticed it. I was so busy talking to him. <laughs> Tell me what I should have asked you, and I didn't. I never know what. Uh, Jump in, jump in, come on. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I uh, yeah, I, I was channel surfing the other day and I, I came across the Dalai Lama who was uh, being interviewed by somebody from the B BBC and I, I can't remember what the question was, but he was trying to answer what was kind of the mark and the measure of authentic religion or religious experience. So it was more like religion. And, you know, his English, I. Is, is, is tough, you know, and, and it's a little, it had subtitles, you know, so you could really understand him. And he said, the mark and the measure of it, he kind of stops. And he, he puts his hand on his chest and he says, warm-heartedness. 
which is a clunky word in English. We would probably wouldn't use it, you know. But he used it several more times, you know, and he'd come back to it. And it was clunky each time, you know, warm heartedness. And I thought, yeah, you know, it, it, part of the sense of it was, you know, that there was an inner peace, a warm heartedness that was internal, a discovery of the truth of who you are. But then it was also about how you are in the world. You know, it's like receiving the tender glance, which is the truth of who God is, and then choosing to be that tender glance in the world. And, and choosing to be in the world who God is, compassionate, loving, and kind. And then you discover, I think, that kindness is the only non-delusional response to everything, and, which is to say all the other responses are delusional. Our rage, our resentment, our, uh, the list is long of those things. All delusional. The only non-delusional response to everything is kindness. So then the warm-heartedness becomes how to be in the world. And, uh, and I think ultimately it's the thing that, that guides and helps and transforms and leads all of us uh, to relational wholeness and a fullness, you know, which is, uh, or as Jesus would say, my joy yours, your joy complete. I think that wraps us up. Thank you all very much. <laughs>